Human sexuality, intimacy and sexual identities are central to our meaningful personal life. They also constitute a basic human right and need. So why is it then that every time we mention sexuality and ageing in the same sentence, people, many people respond by saying, ugh, why is it that the minute we cross an imaginary age threshold that we cease to become sexual human beings? And at what age exactly do we stop having any sexual desires? This is very strange given that the building body of research shows us that, long, that um, opportunities to express love and sexual pleasure are linked to predictors for longevity and well-being. So, why, what are the myths and taboos that make us view sexuality in, and ageing in such a different way? So, myth number one. When you get old, you naturally lose desire for sex. Myth number two. Nobody's interested in this ageing, wrinkly body that just isn't up to it. Myth number three, when older people pursue new sexual relationships in later life, they're putting themselves at risk. This presumed asexuality is directly contradictory when we think about the image of the sexy oldie. So let's think about some of the terminology that we use to describe the sexy oldie. We've got the cougar for the woman, and we've got the dirty old man or pervert for men. It's really not very nice. And my research with lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender older people shows that they experience even more taboos and invisibility. Our research with lesbian and gay, bisexual and transgender older people in care homes shows that they are forced back into the closet when care staff have no idea about how to um, work or recognise their unique sexual identities and culture. In our systematic review that we published this year, we decided to look at well, what does the research tell us about what older people say about their own sexuality? And we read about Maria and Nash. Very typical story. So Maria and Nash are in their late 80s. They've been married for nearly 60 years. And they've had quite a good sex life, and they're very proud of that. But this year, Nash got prostate cancer and following treatment, ended up with erectile dysfunction. Whilst the medics would say he was successfully treated, it's not the case for Nash. He's been left with this inability to perform. And so, in desperation, he goes onto the internet and orders some of those little blue pills. Maria, on the other hand, is so distressed about this, all she wants is for Nash to be healthy. And she's very, very worried about what the implications are for Nash taking these pills that have not been prescribed. Again, she's got nobody to talk to. She's very embarrassed. This sense of humiliation and shame is unacceptable when we think about the long-term care of older people. In the same systematic review, we found that older people are very creative in their sexual practices as they get older. For example, they will uh, experiment much more with their sexual lives. They will uh, use masturbation. They will use uh, foreplay. They don't always go for the gold standard of penetrative sex. So we need to really think and learn about how they see their own sexuality. 
As policymakers, researchers, and practitioners, we need to hear the voices of older people and put them central to the way in which we rework and challenge sexual, social practices about sexuality in old age. We need to recognise that the paradigm of successful ageing is not always consistent with the reality of older people's lives, particularly where they're impacted by health and the limitations that those bring. So, next time you hear the word sexuality and ageing in the same sentence, do not go, uh. I want you to say, I'm listening and I'm interested. And let's hear the voices of older people about their own sexuality. Thank you. <laughs>